um, going to places and not finishing your degree. Or also the other problem that's um, plaguing a lot of people is going to a place like a for-profit college yeah. where they're basically predatory and taking your money and not giving you a whole lot in return. Um, and it costs a lot to go there and people end up defaulting on their student loans at really high rates and that can set you back forever. Yeah. <laughs> I would also though add one of the problems is is in terms of the K through 12 education. Uh, the U.S. has some of the best college education in the world and has lousy K through 12 education in my opinion. Uh, and I think that that's a real problem, and particularly because residential segregation leads to educational segregation. Uh, that poor families and, and families of color are often relegated to inferior schools, and then when they get to college, they spend so much time with remedial studies trying to catch up. For the, for the failed uh, K-12 education that they often don't get the boost uh, that they need for the, the wind at their backs coming out. rather than focusing what I think are structural barriers to people rising out of poverty. I think that if we really want to get people out of poverty, we need to deal with things like criminal justice reform. I think we need to have a system that isn't uh, biased against poor people and people of color. Uh, we need to deal with an educational system that I think is uh, basically sclerotic, that, that hasn't changed in, in 100 years or more in terms of the pedagogy and how we teach. Uh, that is also, also often basically relegates uh, poor people to a second or third class education. I think we need to deal with housing costs that are often driven by government regulations, zoning and land use regulations and things of that nature that drive up the cost of housing and limit mobility so that makes it difficult for poor people to move to a neighborhood that has better education or more jobs. Uh, I think we need to deal with banking laws that, and other regulations that in inhibit poor people from saving. That basically, we, you know, 20% of poor people don't have a driver's license, which means they can't open a bank account. I mean, things of that nature. Uh, we need to deal with in order to enable poor people to actually save and accumulate wealth. Uh, and finally, I think we need to deal with making for an inclusive economic growth. The type of uh, we need to have more economic growth generally. Uh, nothing lifts people out of poverty faster than a growing economy. But we also need to make that economic growth inclusive, and that means allowing poor people to get into the economy, to get jobs, and to, get, to start businesses, and to get into the economy. That means dealing with things like occupational licensure, um, minimum wage laws, things that block essentially people from getting into the, those first jobs. Uh, occupational zoning is another one. Things of that nature that actually prevent poor people from being full participants in the economy. I think I agree on a lot of your diagnoses of um, the things that need to be fixed, um, and we'll disagree on the ways to go about sure. it. I'm sure you're not surprised to do that. Um, but I do think, I mean, I would definitely agree that criminal justice reform is huge um, and a huge barrier. I mean, even just in employment, people with the record have a really difficult time getting a job, um, let alone everything else that comes with it. Um, and I do think that there's a lot of um, ways, I mean, occupational licensing is actually something I agree with. There's, um, basically, it's a, a bureaucratic hurdle for a lot of people to enter something like being a barber or, you know, a lot of different professions, there's just too many hurdles. Um, I disagree, disagree on the minimum wage. Um, and I think that gets to my, my main disagreement, which is that um, I think a huge 
bear, the, the thing that faces people who are living in poverty is they don't have money. And it's really difficult to live when you don't have money. And there's a lot more we could do to help people um, survive um, and get ahead. And I think that if you have a house of your, a roof of your head, and food on the table, um, and clothes for your kids, and those kinds of things, then you can start to move ahead economically. Um, and uh, for me, I think that the government should be doing a whole lot more there. Um, a lot of families don't get housing assistance who should qualify. Um, a lot of families um, make the minimum wage and are living in very deep poverty. Um, the other thing too, I would agree that a growing pie, um, a growing economic pie, you know, it doesn't, it's not like winners or losers, it's not a zero sum game. It's not like if I get ahead, you have to come back down. And I think that that's really important. Um, that was one of my main critiques of Richard Reeves' book is that he seems to think it's a zero sum game. Um, but that said, when our economy grows, it's still growing in a way that has all these structural discrimination hurdles baked into it, and so we have to address those. We have to address systemic racism um, in, in really concrete ways, or a growing pie is just going to accrue to the top. Um, and that sort of brings you back, you know, you, you asked about um, income inequality. It's both what's holding people back and keeping things so stagnant, not just for people in poverty, but basically the 99% of us who are not in the 1% have been stagnant for decades now. But it's also what's happening at the top. Um, and what's allowing incomes of the ultra-rich to grow such, so much faster than everything else. And that speaks to an economy that is um, not working for anyone but them. Um, and so a lot of that has to do with, I, I think the, you can really trace income inequality and its growth back to tax changes. Um, the rich are more and more getting their income from um, capital gains or money made through financial investments, which are taxed at a lower rate than the money the rest of us make through our jobs. Um, and you can see that it starts to take <laughs> off when that change is made. Um, and we've exacerbated that ever since. Um, and then the other thing that's happening, and this gets also to social mobility, which is a little different than just income inequality, you know, if you're born toward the bottom, can you reach the top, um, is the decline in workers' power vis-a-vis -vis their employers, um, the decline in unionization, um, the fact that we have an economy that is actually growing quite healthily right now, um, productivity is growing, um, although somewhat modestly, but corporate profits are growing. We have in many ways recovered from the recession and yet wages are stagnant. Um, those, the fruits are not being shared with employees. Um, and so a lot of that is we've seen a decline in unionization as we've seen a rise in income inequality and a, and a stagnation in social mobility. Um, and there's just, I think, a lot of ways in which we have not um, either encouraged or forced um, businesses to share their profits with the laborers who help them make them. They have a lot of different ways in which they're rewarding shareholders instead, or CEO pay instead, and that's fueling all of these trends. So I would agree with all of that. I think, I mean, I think the other thing is that, um, you know, our political ideology around this um, has, you know, so I was thinking the other day about this new, piece of data that came out about how more than half of whites now feel that they are being discriminated against. And, and you know, it was frustrating at first, but I think if you think about it in terms of, not necessarily that, that you know, they're being actively discriminated against, but I think they do see their opportunities dwindling, or at least, again, stagnating in a way that is unusual for them, right? So, you know, the one thing about the Great Recession is that for, for the first time since the Great Depression, when we didn't really compare whites and blacks so much, whites had an experience momentarily with, that was the experience that blacks have had all the time, that was not unusual for them at all um, in terms of rates of unemployment, in terms of, you know, in terms of job loss, in terms of foreclosing, on, on property and those kinds of things, or finding themselves upside down in their homes. Like, this is common black experience. Um, and so, in a sense, I kind of get the, the, the underlying feeling. Um, and I really think that that is because we have, in, 
in pushing all of those tax cuts and other things that we that you just talked about, um, we sort of let we let sort of hung the whole middle class out to dry, but most of those people are white. Um, and so, you know, we, we have Congress considering now a tax plan that would just skewer all of the people that we're talking about. So anybody outside of that top, you know, one to five percent is going to be skewered by it. Any, any kind of repealing of health care or just killing it um, does the same thing. And so, you know, in some sense, I think it requires sort of refamiliarizing ourselves with what it, you know, what it means to be middle class or, or actually the idea, basically the other, th the other piece of this, right, is that any kind of assistance has been tied to handouts to black and brown people. Right, so our understanding of those kinds of policies or those kinds of tax structures have been tied to helping undeserving black and brown people. When in fact, we are now at a moment where, and, and in fact, it has always been the case that in absolute numbers, more white people benefited from those policies. Um, but they would benefit now as well. But that's not the discourse that's, that's being put out there. Just to uh, bring bring the focus back uh, to college more broadly, although some you make it, it's not, um, it shouldn't be the main focus of policies uh, that deal with inequality or socioeconomic mobility. Um, given that we do see uh, a greater difference in wages for like higher skilled jobs and that growth in low skilled jobs, um, are there um, specific policies that you think are important in making college more accessible as a way um, to gain skills that give access to people to those high skill jobs, or um, are there other sorts of sort of vocational training that are more important than colleges? But how how do we get to a point where that is accessible, um, more accessible to people? Are there specific policies that maybe you have in mind that you think um, work well? I, 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 let me just say I do think we need to have more of a focus on vocational education and also apprenticeships. We uh, and, and these are very difficult actually turned out to do. Uh, vocational education is, is one thing. Apprenticeships, a lot of people talk about. Part of the problem is you can't basically track people into an apprenticeship. You, you saw you get people trained and then they leave and move somewhere else, which is why a lot of companies and a lot of unions don't want to do apprenticeships uh, because the UK is sort of captive, holds uh, apprentices captive, uh, like in the Middle Ages or something. Uh, so, so you have that sort of problem with it. I also, I, I do want to caution a little bit on sort of the idea of, well, let's just get more money from college aid. Uh, I, I think the vast majority of studies out there show that it's essentially passed through in terms of higher tuition. Now, oh, we'll give every student $5,000, and colleges raise their tuition by $5,000, and simply capture it. Uh, and, it, and it actually turns out that all, almost all low-income individuals going to college receive a substantial amount of aid anyway, so what you'd be doing is largely aiding the people with sort of the upper middle class uh, with the, and then it would just pass through on that. So I think there's a little bit of caution you need to do around that. That's why we just have free college. <laughs> um, really, I mean, I think the money that we spend, um, and these days it mostly goes to tax breaks for college education, which flows more toward higher income people than lower income people. You know, Pell Grants um, is one of the, are the biggest um, way that we help lower income people go to college, but they've been starved and shrunk, and now we're doing these tax rates. So instead, if you take a whole pot of money and look at it and compare it to the amount of tuition paid by everyone in public universities, it's kind of the same. So why don't we just do it more directly? Um, I do. I do agree. I think that you know, studies have shown that colleges do sort of just capture more aid. Um, I'm a big fan of um, public goods. Um, and public options too. You know, if it, let's say we had free public college, um, and you let private institutions stay the way they are, they still now have a competitor, um, a free competitor where people can say, well, you know, this is a pretty high quality institution, and it's free, and you're charging me, what is it now, like fifty thousand dollars a year? That may be cheap now. Um, I went to college a while ago. Um, <laughs> um, I'm going to go there, and that that could potentially bring down prices. Um, I don't know. You know, I, I think, like I was saying earlier, the story between 
think of an inequality in college and social mobility in college has become more complicated. But I do think that there still is a value to more education and to opening it up to more people than are able to access it right now. Um, and perhaps it, it was much more accessible, um, particularly, particularly to people further down the income ladder, mm -hmm. then it would really actually have much more of an effect on the ability. Yeah, because I think, you know, with the, with the political and societal circumstance that we find ourselves in, I think that we cannot underestimate the importance of critical thinking and, you know, just access to knowledge and information so that we make good decisions um, in, in realms of public life that, that go beyond our, our, our personal economic circumstances, but in fact influence not only our own personal economic situations, but you know, society more broadly. Um, we're sort of always in conflict between the sort of we the people and the rugged individualism, I think, and you know, rugged individualism seems to be winning. Um, and so there isn't as much concern for the public good in some ways, especially if it's going to cost me something. Um, and I think that's a problem. And I think one of the ways to change that is to make um, education at prior to college better and, and to make college more affordable. Um, and, um, and, and I actually think that there's a, you can do a combination of things that, um, in terms of aid to low income students, that could be helpful and sort of make it less likely. I mean, I think private institutions, if they can raise their prices, they're going to raise their prices. I think that in some sense, um, unless there's a fundamental change in the whole structure and, and we're placing less value on elite college education, right, elite college degrees, so that um, for, I think, for that top 1%, for example, Harvard is still Harvard. And it doesn't really matter if, you know, I don't know, um, Penn State is free. Uh, Penn State could be an amazing school, but Harvard will still be Harvard. And I think the problem is that some of our institutions up at that end take advantage of that in ways that are unfortunate. On the other hand, um, coming from one of the poorer Ivies, you know, I know that. <laughs> We have made commitments to financial aid uh, for low-income students that we will never be able to sustain. Um, and I don't know if that means that we go back to the drawing board and try to think about it differently. I mean, it would certainly be helpful if we stop starving Pell Grants and federal work study and those other kinds of aid. Um, but, you know, for better or worse, we have a president who wants to do right by low-income students, and that just means that you know items one through five on fundraising are financial aid, um, and still we probably will never be able to sustain it. And we did get dinged for you know advertising ourselves as loan-free. We're not really loan-free. We're not we're not Princeton, Yale, and Harvard, and we're never going to be Princeton, Yale, and Harvard in that regard. And so I think we do have to think more creatively about how to make things accessible for low-income students without then raising the price um, so that we're just making up the difference by charging those who can pay full freight more. Because what happens is that, again, that middle class is being hit pretty hard. And it, you know, 20 years ago, there were people in the middle class who could afford to pay 75% of it if they couldn't, and we can't do that anymore. And so I, I do think that's an issue. Um, and though, again, as I said, I would never say that the Ivies and Ivy peers and other elite schools should abandon the mission of increasing access to low-income and first-generation college students. Either do you have any response to that or else we're going to move on? Okay. Um, um, so this last slide, um, are these all statistics from Pomona, and it's showing um, the number of low-income students um, in, a, in a given class. So it's divided up into uh, class 
larger classes of 15 or more, which is large, large ish. Classroom. Classroom, this is the actual classroom. So um, these are classrooms small and this is larger than 15. So you can see that um, for uh, smaller classes, um, there's almost a 50% uh, chance of there'll be zero uh, students in the lowest 40% um, income zip code. Um, so can you speak to how uh, income inequality and how that manifests in, can manifest in, in, in class conflict and just on the national level and then just what are the, what are the dynamics um, that we get into in a classroom where you have numbers um, like this? So I think it's interesting because I imagine that for a lot of schools, um, you could you know, replace low income with black or Latino or LGBTQ and get similar numbers. The difference is that for some of those categories, it's obvious, right? So you're sitting there and that one brown student stands out and, um, and we know, we've heard all kinds of stories about how that can play out in a classroom depending on the subject matter of the discussion. I think the interesting thing about low income um, and, you know, and I, I suppose this is the one thing about Penn that um, taught me sort of how residential segregation is, was different at the time by income, right? Because what we knew is that low income whites tended to live in higher income white neighborhoods, they'd be dispersed and, you know, and it helped in terms of the schools they had access to and all of those things. And so as we start talking about low income first generation students, um, you know, we have to keep in mind that there are white students in that too. And that low income white student, nobody really knows because we stereotype, again, we attach low income to brown. And, um, and so there's this invisibility uh, for low income white students that I think that my, my experience working with students has suggested can be really um, troublesome and, and result in some of the same feelings of isolation and alienation, particularly if you're on a campus like Penn's that you know, has a lot of affluence and in fact the expectation for white students is that they are affluent. Um, and so I, you know, I imagine that again, depending on the conversation, depending on the, the subject, um, there can be real obvious sources of concern if you're talking about class dynamics. Um, but on the other hand, I think if you're talking about just knowledge, that often those low-income students have been exposed to less prior to coming to college, and it means that they're sitting in a classroom feeling um, self-conscious about participating because it looks like everybody knows more than they do. Um, and, uh, and sometimes that means they might talk less. And so then if participation is part of the grade, you're getting dinged for that because you're not participating. Um, we know that low income students often won't, they often haven't been sort of trained to do the kinds of things that get you um, more and better consideration when you're on the borderline for grades, right? So, you know, we tell students all the time, form relationships with your professor. Don't go to office hours just when you need something, right? Go and get to know them as a person and let them know you because then when you're on the border between a B plus and an A minus, they might actually push you over into the A minus or if you have to miss a lot of class, they might work with you a little more. And I think that, you know, that, low, that in these circumstances, often low income students don't have that it, they don't feel as comfortable doing those things, right? There's an ethic, there's an ethos that is like, I gotta pull myself together and do this on my own. And they bring that into a circumstance where most everyone else knows that it's the opposite of that, right? And so they, they put themselves at a disadvantage by thinking that everybody got here by doing it all by themselves um, and that they're supposed to get through it without asking for help. I've had students whose grades plummeted, and I called them in to find out that you know a sibling had been shot to death, but they thought that they didn't have the right to come and say, well, I'm struggling. Where I've had white students who have said to me, literally, you know, I have my best friend from high school came to visit over the weekend, and I just didn't get to your paper, and expected an extension. Like, and that's normal, 
Okay, and so all students should be at least on the same level where, where that is concerned. And low-income students typically don't take those kinds of, of opportunities, um, where they often are most likely to have circumstances that would lead to a professor saying, of course, you can have a little extra time, or is there any, you know, can we make some adjustments? And so I think there are two things that happen here, um, both the in-class piece of it and then the outside of class piece. That's interesting, because a similar thing happens in the economy, right? Because I think right, a lot of people who are already, um, you know, whose parents, let's say, are in higher income brackets and in like, you know, white collar professional jobs, are up close and personal with the fact that that's not something they did to stress to who you know and your networks and, and all of that. And then it takes a real learning curve to figure that out if you haven't been exposed to it. That it's not just about sending out resumes and hoping someone calls you back or just doing a good job, sadly, and getting ahead. That it's a lot of it is um, relationship based and network based. And also about, you know, um, affiliation. Um, you know, class is. I think really complicated in this country, and, and like you were saying, a lot it can be invisible, and so um, it's it's tough for people to talk about or even identify with. But certainly, there are ways in which people um, either feel, you know, a boss will feel, oh yeah, you're a culture fit here because you look and talk and act in the same <laughs> way as their class, and someone who doesn't, whose clothes are cheaper, right? You know, however it is that consciously or unconsciously they're sort of sorting you. Um, will say, oh, you're just not a culture fit here, which is usually either explicitly or implicitly saying, you know, you're just not like me. I, I don't feel comfortable around you. Um, you know, to your to your question about class, I just I think I think this is really fascinating. Um, I think we don't talk about class enough in this country. Um, you know, we have basically as rigid a social class structure as say like the UK where we think of it as being extremely rigid and they talk about it more and we just don't talk about it. We all, there's polling that shows that like something like I think 90% of Americans call themselves middle class which is just not true. <laughs> um, and so the way we talk about it and, and that's capturing both you know, low-income people who probably are not middle class but sort of aspire to it or, or say, you know, I'm good, I'm, I'm, I've got as much as I need, I, you know, I don't need a handout, as well as rich people who say, oh, no, 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 I'm middle class, I, you know, I have to send my kids to private school and vacations are so expensive these days. Like, I've gotten these reader emails and I'm like, I mean, I hear you, but also <laughs> you're choosing to go to vacation on a vacation and send your kid to private school. Um, and I wish we had a better way of talking about it because I think that that would allow us to address it better. And I think, you know, being the lonely, low-income student in a class, um, it would be a different thing if we recognized that as a thing than if we just pretend that it's not a it, it clearly is a thing. <laughs> and I, I mean, I, I certainly think that you have to look at that. I also think being the lone minority in a class is, is difficult. Uh, I don't think we should uh, fail to mention gender issues as well. I mean, uh, we acculturate women not to not to raise their hands, not to speak out in class, and so on, which which can have a real negative effect uh, in, in terms of of uh, how you how you finish school and things of that nature. So I do think these are all uh, issues. That said, I'm going to suggest that everybody is different. There's, there's always going to be the person in a class who is going to be different than other people. Uh, there's people who are terribly shy, and they are simply not going to speak up or, or whatever when they have a problem. And it doesn't matter what class or whatever they come from, they are simply, that's, that's them. There are people who are going to be the class clown, they're jocks, and they're, they're out there, and they're doing their thing, and they're always going to be like that in a, in a class. And, the, and these folks are going to be, have different reactions to them, get treated differently, and so on. We have to be a little bit careful about how much leveling down we're going to try and do was the old Vonnegut uh, short story on uh, Kilgore Trout or whatever, where you know where they, if you were smart, they put a headphone on you and blasted music in your ears, and if you were uh, attractive, they made you wear a mask, and uh, if you were a good athlete, they put weights on your leg, ankles, and stuff like that, so that everybody would uh, would have the same. Nobody would have advantage or disadvantage. The fact is, people are always going to have advantages and disadvantages as long as we can meet certain minimum levels. 
Beyond that, people are never going to be truly equal. Um, I guess I'm also wondering, um, you talked about that, that being invisible and maybe that low-income student not sharing their experiences, not contributing, that, that voice being lost in a classroom. Um, what do you think the impacts then are um, on, on class discussions and, and sort of it, moving forward when we think about schools like Pomona as basically preparing people, pre-professional people, uh, preparing a whole class of people and then those people don't hear the perspective of the low-income student in their class, don't have contact with maybe some low-income people because of that, what, what is the impact of that? I mean, I want to be careful here because I, so I understand the whole diversity for diversity's sake and the, you know, and the educational value of being exposed to people different from you. But, but when you get into a circumstance where there's only one or one or two, that person becomes kind of a cultural tour guide in a way that is not good at all. Um, so that that person should never be the expert on being low income any more than they should be the expert on the black experience or the Latino experience or the you know gay experience, whatever it is. That's not good either. Um, and so, you know, there's a way in which the way we talk about diversity now sort of leads us into this really ugly territory, I think, where it becomes then that the, the job of the um, diverse candidates or the diverse students, which is a stupid way to describe it, and it just makes the blood boil every time, but that, that it's their job, so to speak. You're here to enhance my education, right? So that's kind of the other extreme, and I don't think that that's a good way to be either. I mean, one way to look at it is that if we could do a better job admitting more low-income students, just as if we could do a better job in, in admitting more of lots of underrepresented groups, this would happen less often. And there is a sort of critical mass idea that, that then you actually do have a diverse experience. So if you have one low income student, and if that's not diversity, um, because you've got one, and then 14 others, you know, or, or 10 others, or whatever, <coughs> it's not that. And that, that's not diversity. That, I don't want to call it tokenism because I don't think we're doing it just to say we did it. I think that universities do believe that this is an important thing for us to do. I think there are also just limits on how much of it we can do given the money we have to, to put towards it. Um, and unfortunately, um, the level of preparation, uh, you know, because we do want to admit students that we believe can flourish. Um, and so if, if we are trying to stay true to both of those things, unfortunately, the more selective schools are going to have a smaller pool to draw from until we pay better attention to the 10,000 or 25,000, there's something like 25,000 students every year who, um, who are low income and often racial minorities who have the test scores and the grades for these kinds of schools but don't apply because they think they can't afford it or that they won't get in. And so when they take the SAT, they're not kind of sending their information out as widely. So we are missing a certain subset of the population as well. Um, but, I, you know, I, yeah, I, that's not, that's not diversity, so it's not serving that mission that we say we want to serve by putting students in that situation where they, they're the only ones. Now, I think institutionally, again, we know we do this and that we ought to be doing a better job of kind of taking that seriously and thinking about what it means for the students who end up in that circumstance and how we can sort of expose them to the capital that other students are taking advantage of that would sort of start to decrease the gap between what it means to be an affluent student and what it means to be a low income student in terms of the sort of the, the class privilege that really comes with what those students think they can say and what they can do and what they can ask for and, and kind of level the playing field there. And just to sort of continue that, I mean, 
again to go back to the networking idea, you know, if, if um, call the population of, in, of college students, sort of generally speaking, tends to be from higher income families, and then they have these elite college degrees, and then they're going out to the economy. I think it's safe to say that a lot of these are going to be sort of our bosses and our leaders and people with power and influence. Um, if you have not been exposed to a lot of low-income people and what that looks like and what they're like and who they are, just you know, knowing people to bring them into your network, um, that continues to keep that divide. Um, and that's true, again, I mean, that's definitely true for race, um, for sexual orientation. I mean, it's true for all these things. Um, but I do think, I mean, you're right, this is not diversity. And, and until you have a, a bigger mass um, of, of low-income students in colleges like that, like this and like other lead institutions, um, you're not getting that. You're not getting those connections and that exposure. And it would, I think it would really benefit both sides. Mm -hmm. Let me, let me broaden that, though. I mean, I, mean and I, I think you're absolutely correct, and it's that connection that makes a big difference. Uh, studies show, for example, that support for uh, gay marriage expanded significantly if you knew a gay person. Uh, I mean, as you connect with people, you, you feel very differently about it. But I think it goes beyond sort of the categorical type of thing. We need, I mean, you need intellectual diversity as well, or ideological diversity, broad sets of opinions. I mean, if you live, if you go through your entire college career and never speak to anyone who voted for Trump, you may, you know, you're going to have a very different viewpoint of why they did, how they're reacting, why the society is behaving the way it is. I think you need to have that exposure as well to to people out there who might think differently than we do. Younger people just didn't vote as large, as large number for Trump, though. So <laughs> college campuses in general. Yeah. Don't well, have there's the, <laughs> All right, thank you guys so much. Uh, that was amazing. <laughs>